Thank you for turning to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at another electronic offering from Mongoose Traveler for second edition. And this is the Lunian Shield World. This is a companion to the Bowman Cluster, Bowman Arm uh, supplement that was out for the Spinward Marches. I reviewed that one a few weeks ago. So today we're going to take a look at the second of these. There are only two in the set. I think I erroneously said there were more than that in the first uh, video. But there are only two of these. And they're, they're both good quality. I'm going to go into where the shield worlds are, why they're called the shield worlds, uh, and uh, how you can adventure in them. Uh, it's it's a pretty nice little book. Uh, if it seems like I'm doing a, a fair amount of these ebooks lately, I am, and there's a reason for that. My eyes are old. Reading a printed page fatigues them. I've been reading a lot of printed pages lately. If you've been following my channel, I've done uh, a number of reviews of stuff that I only have in print. I find it easier, oddly enough, to read the, on the pad. So from time to time, I am going to go into clumps of these, and it's really just to let my eyes recover from all the previous reading. It takes a lot of reading, a lot of research to do these videos. So you're going to have to bear with me while I take a look at a book that I really enjoyed anyway. Uh, this is by Mongoose. It's available also on DriveThruRPG. Uh, $5.99, I believe, for uh, both. I'll, I'll include the links below. Uh, it's about 24 pages, a little stiff for, for $6, but that being said, I liked it enough that I'm doing a video about it, and I'm saying I liked it, so there you go. I, I felt it was money well spent. So we're going to take a look at this today on page 121. The Lunian Shield Worlds. This is in the Glisten subsector of the Spinward Marches. Uh, written by Martin J. Doherty for uh, Mongoose, which is always a winner. Uh, and here we get the introduction on what they are. The interesting thing about the Lunian shield worlds, uh, it's an unofficial term. Basically, these are uh, worlds that border the uh, the sword worlds. Sorry, blanked on that. That blank uh, that border on the sword worlds. So they're not shield worlds in the sense that they're all built up and militarized, and oh, the minute the sword world is stick their head out, they're going to get it chopped off. So much as their tripwire worlds, as these worlds fall, as the sword worlders come surging out of their space, that will be a warning to the Imperium. So it's kind of a misnomer that they're called shield worlds. They're really kind of just, just there as tripwires. Uh, interesting, but it's where some people are born and raised. So what are you going to do about that? You can't really affect that, a lot of that. I mean, you can move around in Traveler, of course. But uh, So basically, uh, the Lunian subsector was settled during the early Imperial expansion of the ship Spinward Marches. Looney itself became an important local and trade hub. Uh, expansion has been kind of sporadic because it's not part of the Imperium. Uh, Looney itself and the Shield Worlds and, and the, the main that runs through here are all part of, uh, they're all just independent space right now. There's still talk and murmurs that the Imperium is going to go ahead and, and build these up, but some say that that's just uh, set for the Sword Worlds to think about before they decide to maybe conquer something. So we just get a nice look at the space around here. We get the neighboring regions, and this goes with the Bowman Arms set that was out uh, electronically just before this one. Here's the section of the world that it's in. We have the Sword Worlds right there. We have the Lunian Shield Worlds sitting right here. Uh, there, there are Shield Worlds that are uh, a good main, but they're also in harm's way, kind of, and then the Third Imperium is back here. And then we get the Worlds of Note. We, uh, some of these systems are not part of the shield worlds per se. Uh, they're still kind of lumped in there. And this is Arba in the Lunian uh, subsector. And the very first time I saw that, I thought it said Abba. And I thought, oh my goodness, but no, it's Arba. Um, Arba system has, uh, provides a jump to link between Lanth, Lunian, and Dernwin in the Sword Worlds Confederation. And it's not unheard of for folks in these uh, regions to trade with sword worlders or sword worlders to come in and, and trade through the shield world. Uh, some interesting dynamics that go on here. And it talks about how some places don't mind the sword worlders at all and other places kind of like them and others hate them. And then we get to Rabwar. Rabwar. Uh, described as an almost agricultural world. It's a little bit on the uh, dry side, but it's very good at... Uh, growing crops. So it's a an agricultural world, which uh, doesn't really shake the foundations of anybody, but everyone's got to eat. So ag worlds can become pretty important. 
and then we're going to get the nice map of the Lunian subsector itself. The shield worlds are properly described as these guys here, these six worlds on this, this main. And as you see, it makes a beautiful main. And it goes up to the sword worlds and over here. It's a really nice uh, place. Place We've got the Imperium here, right here handy. You've got the shield worlds right there. You've got some interesting stuff right here. So it's definitely worth uh, adventuring in here. So then we go to Grote. Uh, not really an important world. Uh, it's the last major port in the Imperium before the vessel enters District 268. My campaign is taking place in two, District 268. A number of my Traveler campaigns have taken place in Deuce, District 268. It's a fun place to adventure. There's lots of stuff you can do. And then, of course, over to the Five Sisters subsector as well. I love District 268. I, I like this book because it, it dovetails nicely with District 268. And then we get a Pankwar uh, in the Union also. It's a large, wet world with a tainted atmosphere. Its population is just 3,000 living in a single enclave. Some worlds say it's a red zone. Others say it's an amber zone. It's kind of confusing because there aren't any prohibitions against you actually going to this world. You can if you want to, but you're kind of doing it at your own risk. So this really gives a uh, referee an opportunity to really come up with something for gaming. A red world can be designated that simply because it's a closed-off culture, possibly for religious or societal reasons where they don't want outsiders in it, tainting it. So that can make a world a red world, uh, red, red zone, but it could also be an amber zone if they're somewhat tolerant of outsiders. So this is really kind of a blank slate for the referee. Harvoset, also in Lunion, is a desert world with barely enough atmosphere to support it. It's home to 90 million people because of its mineral wealth. This world is a, just kind of a rock, but uh, they take these massive harvesters and they plunk them down over a chunk of land that seems to have a good mineral run, whatever mineral that's, they're looking to harvest, and this thing just goes and rips the heck out of it, dumps all its uh, detritus behind it, and uh, continues on. And they, they, the company says, hey, it's fine for the world. Look, there's stuff growing back where we churn it all up, and then there's environmental groups saying... No, you're just destroying whatever ecosystem this world has. You're evil, you're bad. Stop it. So that's really, again, up to the uh, DM. GM, sorry. I think I said DM earlier. I apologize. Persephone. It's an average-sized world with sufficient water to support a strong ecosystem. It is a little chilly with a tainted atmosphere that can be breathed after a while. Uh, it's home to an Imperial Interstellar Scout Service way station, a major base whose official purpose is to support the Expo Communications. Really, it's an intelligence gathering listening post. It's so close to the uh, sword worlds that uh, a lot of information flows through this and then it gets sent out to other areas. And now we go to the Lunian shield worlds proper. And here are the actual shield worlds. And it's a nice little main, but there's not a lot on here because it's kind of a backwater main. Abadici. Let's see where Abadici falls. Abadici is right there. It's got an, a main starport. Uh, it's a major significant, a majorly significant starport. The world itself is not nearly so prominent, so it's a, a major stop because of the starport. It has 800 million inhabitants uh, under strict governmental control. Uh, the downport itself is quite small because the, the planet's really just kind of a rock ball. Um... Uh, most of the people living in the Downport and Associated Star Town of off-world origin. And there's little cultural meaning between them and the locals. Uh, this can be a good place to pass maybe less than legal goods uh, through the Starport and through the Downport. And now we go to Zabon. Uh, its primary is a giant red star whose gravitational jump shadow makes it impossible to directly access the remaining worlds of the inner system. The inner system world, innermost worlds were consumed when the giant group, the star drew to, grew to its current size. Uh, one of the planets is thought to be borderline inhabitable, but it's deep within the jump shadow and is not really used. Uh, Zabon's asteroid belt lies outside the star's jump shadow, so you can actually jump really close to this particular asteroid belt and do service or trade or whatever you need to do. So that makes this a good quick stop. You don't have a lot of time running in a jump shadow. 
you can jump in really close to the port, do your business, and then jump out really close to the port. So not a lot of downtime moving around in the system. Tanalfi, it's an Earth-like planet, though not a although with a hotter climate and a slightly tainted atmosphere. It supports a diverse ecosystem and is highly suitable for agricultural activity. Um, the original colonists came from the sword worlders and were very glad that it was the good ag world because they were would have had trouble otherwise. Um, today, the population has grown to some 60 million and has a strong democratic condi- uh, tradition. Uh, its excellent starport is a link on the export network and maintains a flotilla of support craft in addition to the world's modest enforcement and defense system. Uh, the only uh, source of Tech Level 14 goods for several parsecs is Tanalfi, and it's a major exporter and primarily imports raw materials to manufacture these things. So a TL-14 uh, exporter, it's it's a pretty important world. Whoops. I don't know why it does that. Okay. Spirel. Earth-like mid-tech world lying behind the Lunian Shield. It lacks a high-tech industrial base. Um, therefore, it's not a real important world, but it's still one you can trade with, and it is one that will take raw goods and manufacture them as best they can. Olympia, small world with a great deal of surface water, a thin, tainted atmosphere. You can't live out it for long. Um, the locals can briefly function without compressor masks, where off-worlders would rapidly lose consciousness. Uh, population is very uh, careful about what they do. It operates at tech level 7, but no manufacturing capability of that. So technically, it would be a little bit less than that even, uh, which is pretty interesting. And again, they it's kind of an Imperium land grab world, originally settled for no better reason than prevent sword worlders, sword worlders from claiming it. Smaug. Uh, it was kind of grabbed for the same reason as Olympia, but it has extensive mineral wealth, especially iron. And it's a mar- far more important acquisition because of that. Uh, smog is a vast, dusty desert with virtually no standing water. You have to have filter masks. You have to shield your equipment against dust contamination. Dust is a constant problem here. So now we go to the system profile for Warden. Warden system. It has five terrestrial planets and two gas giants. Here we go. Uh, so we have the uh, various planets that are there. Warden itself, of course, in Traveler, the name of the main world gives the uh, system its name. So Warden is the inhabited Imperial member world. And then we just take a look at the various rocks and gas giants that are here. Nice little adventuring world. Again, that's what this book is. It's just a bunch of places for you to adventure, uh, bring your characters, and a nice background for it. Uh, There are two scout bases in the Warden system. Uh, There was, the oldest one was built on Warden itself, and it was, at the time, the Starport. And it was used as a listening post for the Sword Worlds. Over time, the installation grew until a second facility was built around the largest moon of Enix. From this point on, the original base waned in importance, and the one around Enix became far more important. But again, this is just a listening post for the Scout's intelligence gathering arm. Warden itself, breathable if thin atmosphere and 60% water coverage. Uh, Very well run and maintained starport. In their tech level level 11 on Warden itself, uh, and they can create other higher tech things with their industrial base. It's just that they're categorized as tech 11 because it's primarily what they do. A variety of plant and animal life. And... uh, We get a look at some of the life. Zettel's Grazer, which is basically uh, kind of an ox cow. Uh, Not too smart. Uh, They're not really aggressive. um, And they're good to eat. And then, of course, a Swamp Swarm. Basically uh, an annoying, biting insect that in large groups can actually... They give off a paralytic each time they bite. So if they bite you enough, they can actually paralyze you and uh, then devour you. And then we get a look at the people of Warden itself. That's why I like this book, because it, it starts out big with the whole system, uh, the subsector, then we come down to systems, then we come down to just the one system, and we get a look at the people of Warden. And the people of Warden is well integrated, uh, no real racial divides or separate enclaves. 
and no real cultural variation. So it's a, a kind of a just straight up uh, cosmopolitan world and uh, alien species, alien to human species are not considered unusual. Adventures on Warden in the Shield Worlds, Flight to Evade Capture is one of them, Industrial Espionage, oh, so many Traveler games are like that, A Flare for the Dramatic, and Foul Play. And that and we're out of the book. It's 23 pages long, but that includes the cover and the artwork. Uh, so again, you're getting around 20, 20, 29, 18 to 20 pages of actual text for $6. A little high on the price, I get it. But I also think this is worth getting. So there it is. My quick look at the Lunian Shield Worlds. Hard to say. Uh, please let me know what you, you thought about my look at this book. Uh, let me know if uh, it's something that you're going to think of, maybe pick up. Use, use behind the claw in your game. That's it for today on page 121. Please remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Anybody who has, thank you. Also, I have a Patreon going to my patrons. Thank you. Uh, anybody who is thinking about it, come on in. We talk about games a lot. So that's it for today on page 121. Thank you for your time. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.